Now this next snake is, is one that is fairly uncommon uh, in collections because they're protected. They have a very tiny range. Uh, we got this from a researcher, so that's why, that's why we have it. This is not something we would collect from the wild. This is a Grand Canyon rattlesnake. And these guys have a very limited range within the Grand Canyon. You can find them from the very bottom of the canyon all the way to the very top. And they also are found in a limited area um, up in Utah, north of the Grand Canyon. This snake is very old. Yeah, this snake is, we're not even sure how old this it's snake is. It's over 30 years old. Um, this was an original study animal of uh, Gordon Shewitt. Um, and when he, uh, had, he did some hormonal research with this animal, looking at reproductive cycles, and uh, when it, he was finished with the research, this animal was not releasable. And so that's why we have it. Um, yeah, it's very old. I love this guy's rattle. Um, it's really long. He doesn't do anything, so that's why his rattle is so long, because he doesn't move around very much. <laughs> so it just sits there and gets longer. You start us talking about them being fat. You see little fatty deposits on this snake. Yeah. Because it's getting old and it doesn't move around a lot, it's starting to get fat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this guy, uh, because I know Gordon used him in some reproductive research, I wanted to tell you about something that we learned um, last year at the Biology of Rattlesnakes meeting. And uh, this is a story that was told by um, a researcher who actually came from Kentucky, and now she um, works in uh, Arizona. Her name is Melissa Amarello. And she's doing all sorts of radio telemetry with different rattlesnakes. Arizona black rattlesnakes, tiger rattlesnakes, western diamondbacks, mojaves. Um, but this is about Arizona, or, yeah, Arizona blacks. And uh, she was radio tracking a gravid female who was getting ready to have babies. And she was observing this female who had not yet had babies, and it was in a rock crevice. She was down on the ground looking into the rock crevice, and she could see the female, and she could also see a baby rattlesnake. And we know that it wasn't that female's baby because that female hadn't dropped yet, it was radio telemetry. So this is someone else's baby who also was using that same gestation site. Some of you may know that timber rattlesnakes will frequently group together for, to use rookeries where the temperature is good to gestate their babies. Other rattlesnakes will do that too. So this was someone else's baby, relatively newborn. And Melissa could tell that the, the radio telemetry female was watching her because if she shifted around, just like the Western Diamondback was watching Jim, this female would come to her head and watch to keep an eye on what Melissa was doing. Well, at some point, the baby rattlesnake uncoiled and started to crawl out from underneath the rock. And when that happened, the adult female took maybe the front half of her body and put it in the way of the baby and left it there for a few minutes. And then eventually she curled back up and the baby had coiled back. Now, there were, I don't know what, those of you who were there, 150, 200 people at that conference? I don't think there was a closed mouth in the room. We were all like, it was amazing. So, we've known for a long time that rattlesnakes have their babies, they have live birth, they stay with the babies until they shed for the first time, which is typically 10 days to two weeks. And we figure they do that because the mother's a big rattlesnake, so she just gives off of some protection to the babies. And we've known that baby timber rattlesnakes will follow the scent trails left by the adults to find the hibernacula in the winter. But to me, this observation, and it's just one observation, this is not something that is set in stone or that we know everything about, but to me that one observation is really interesting. And I think that it implies there might be a little bit more going on in their head than we give them credit for. We've seen in captivity both rocks. Yeah, we, we have taken at the zoo, um, if there is a, a snake that has live birth, especially if it's a pit viper, we leave the babies in with the female until they shed for the first time. And uh, it, it, we've only just recently started doing this when we found out about this wild behavior. And it seems like the babies might be eating better. And uh, the females, we have seen protective baby behavior where the females will coil on top of the babies and the babies will go behind her. They may strike at us more frequently than they normally do. So this is stuff that's really interesting and is not very well studied. Um, but I think if you run into people, you know, Dr. Richter last night was talking about educating people, and if you run into people who are terrified of rattlesnakes, which a lot of people are, um, I, I think telling them that they're good mothers is kind of a nice thing to say, right? You know? <laughs> um, it's really hard to think something is evil if it's a good mother. So. <laughs>
both drops I, when I was spraying the other day, the babies were drinking out of the coils of the mother. You know, she tightened up a hold of water for them. Or she does it for herself too, they'll drink off their own coils. But the babies were sitting there drinking out of the coils. So unfortunately I didn't video that. Yeah. I, um, you know the, um, for those of you who aren't who don't know the scientific names, both drops is a lance headed viper, which is a South American hip viper. That's the one I've been meeting for the yeah. last <laughs> two years ago for that. The uh, Chimonetsa shed one day. That's so, true. We did have a, a Central America, or excuse me, Venezuelan rattlesnake, um, and the, the baby shed pretty much like right after they were born. So there probably is not maternal care in that um, animal. So interesting. I don't know why. So, yeah. What? Yeah, that's right. <laughs>